camera as kids. Really fun to watch. So I, I share this because sometimes we have to be a little creative, right? The business has changed dramatically. I enjoyed your presentation earlier today. And to think back to the 1980s and the 90s, when cold calling was rampant and, and people were just selling stocks and selling bonds and selling, you know, hot performance over the phone. It was about commodities then. It was about performance. It was about my fund is better than your fund. It's really changed. Now it's about relationships. And the seven life priorities I just love. So we're gonna, we, we're gonna weave into that in just a little bit. But the business certainly changed. And I'd rather have it now because we can control the relationships, can't we? Right? You can't really control performance. So we're gonna talk about three things today. Powerful scripting, strengthening client relationships, and gaining quality referrals just for a moment. But before I do, Jill, uh, there was supposed to be a timing. Now, when I first learned about this, I hired a coach, Mark Bagnatha, who actually wrote So What? and uh, the CD that's in front of you. So I started working with him in 1997. He said, okay, Neil, I was a wholesaler back then. He said, I want you to work on scripting. And my first thought was, seriously? I'm gonna sound robotic? I didn't buy into that at all. And, he's, and, and it made me think back to a phone call I received one day. I was making dinner back in the 70s. Phone rings, I pick it up, and I hear this. Hello, is this the woman or the man of the home? I mean, now I'm, I'm a little upset, because I can't tell, and it's a poor script that's poorly set. And I'm, I'm not a wise guy, but I had to have a little bit of fun with this, and I said, actually, this is the family's golden retriever. And I've been taught to take calls like this, how may I help you? And there was a pause and there was a click. That's a bad script, real bad script, but if you think back to your favorite movies, think about, you know, give me some movies that you've seen recently, they really, everything they did was scripted, but it was rehearsed so well that it just rolled off naturally, didn't it? It seemed like it was sincere and from the heart, which is ideal. So when we talk about scripting, I want you to think about sales people, acting, the politicians. Generally when the politician goes off script, he, gets, he or she gets in trouble, right? So when I talk about scripting, I'm not talking about the boring robotic scripting. Something more fun than that. So here's why I ask this question. We talk about psychic real estate. When you hear plop, plop, fizz, fizz, what do you think of? Right. Now, some of the young folks in the audience may not be aware of this because the last time the commercial was on was about 25 years ago, right? So who said Alka-Seltzer? Great. And what do you visualize? What do you see happening? Soda water. Yeah, yeah. You drop these two tablets about the size of a half dollar in a, in a glass of water when you weren't feeling so good, maybe up a little late last night or ate something that gave you indigestion, and you see these tablets dissolving in the, in the glass, and you knew it would spell relief soon. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. So here's why I ask the question. What is your psychic real estate when someone's talking to one of your clients about you? How do they envision you? How do they describe you? Right? You can really build that out. You can really become the go-to person. And I'll give you some ideas in just a little bit. But when we talk about hamburgers, what do you think of? They have McDonald's, right? They own that psychic real estate. What about copy machines? They don't even make copy machines anymore. Right? But they own that psychic real estate. And the final one is cola. What do you think of? Coca-Cola, absolutely. So psychic real estate, the words, feelings, and pictures you associate to a product, a service, or a person. So I want to build that out a little bit over the next uh, half hour. So here's what the so what question does. It helps you filter the needs of your audience first. Remember the pilots I talked about, leadership, confidence, and direction. So the so what positioning statement is a simple scripted conversation starter that answers the question that you've probably all been asked. So what do you do, right? Who has a good answer? It's the power of three things, the right words, the so what mindset, and scripting and practice. If you do it right, it quickly captivates the attention and people want to learn more about what you're doing. So let me jump right into this. You're at a business meeting in Boston, where I'm from, and there are about 25 business owners at this meeting. And we ask each person to stand up, <clears throat> give us their name, and tell us what they do. So Barbara stood up. She said, hi, I'm Barbara Cobo, banker. Been selling homes for 25 years. If I can help you find a home, I'd be happy to do that. Next guy stood up. He said, I'm Ryan Ralph with Minus Muffler. I've owned that franchise for 30 years. I'm right down on Main Street. Next guy stood up and he said, hi, I'm Floyd, I'm an automotive consultant. And then he sat down. So now I ask all of you, and I know you're tired, but you're in the home stretch. We're almost done. What's an automotive consultant? Car salesman, right? That's what we thought. But there were a lot of question marks in people's faces. So we said, Floyd, sorry, don't mean to put you on the spot, 
would you explain more about what you do? Because we don't quite understand. We've never heard that term. He said, of course I will. He said, do you know how most people don't like the process of buying a new car because they don't like dealing with a salesperson? How do you agree? Right? And we're in sales. He said, well, what I do for my clients is for $295, I take them through a 15-point process to determine the exact right car for them and what their needs are, and then I go to the dealership with them, I negotiate the best price. People are like, oh, now I get it. So that was his positioning statement. Let me ask you, because you've never heard this before, how much did he charge? 295, how many points in the process? 15, and then what did he do? He helped you figure out your car and then negotiate the best price. That is the beauty of a positioning statement versus when you get asked and you say, oh, I'm a financial advisor with Merrill Lynch. I know what that is. I've been in this financial services business since 1987. But what if, what, what if when you're talking to somebody and you say, I'm a financial advisor with Merrill Lynch, and they think back to the 80s and they think, oh, a stock jockey. I know what you do. Are we stock jockeys anymore? Not all, the whole business has changed dramatically. You do it all. You're the, you're the go-to people. You can handle anything, any financial need they have, any life need they have. Am I right? Absolutely. So don't sell yourself short by saying you're a financial advisor. Before you leave, I'm going to give you a scripted positioning statement to use. And of course, you can work on it the way you want. So part one is to create agreement using an undeniable truth. So in your case, what I would say is, do you know how so many people are concerned about outliving their assets? Is that a major concern? Yeah. Let's just step back to the 40s, 1940s. If you're my financial advisor, I sit with you and I say, you've been great, bless, me, bless you. You've been great working with me. I've saved all this money. I'm 63. I'm going to retire. And I'm thrilled. Thank you. To which you would reply, Neil, this money is going to last you the rest of your life. What's the life expectancy of a male in the 1940s? 65. You'd be exactly right. It'll last you the rest of your life. I can almost guarantee that. Not that we have guarantees. Okay? I don't want to get compliance ready. However, in 1990s, well, you went through these numbers earlier today, right? People living to be 85 and 90. What's the oldest client somebody has in this room? Anyone in the 90s? Yeah. You know what I mean? Things have changed dramatically. So your role as financial advisors is absolutely critical. It's one of the most important relationships any investor, any person can have going forward. All right? So very, very critical. But if you just say a financial advisor, I think you're selling yourself short. So I'm going to give you some other ideas. Part two is really the most important idea in how it helps the audience. So here's what I came up with today after listening to you speak earlier today. <clears throat> Do you know how so many clients, so many people, work with me. So many people are concerned about outliving their assets and many advisors they talk to only talk about performance. Well, what we do at Merrill Lynch is really completely different. We work, we work with our prospects and our clients and go over the seven life priorities. Now, how many folks are going to get that? You say seven life priorities. And you can go into the whole picture and say, you yeah, know, we have this, we have health, we have you know, uh, aging parents, and I, I, remember, I remember the circle you had, but you have, you could say, we cover everything. We don't want to just invest your assets. We want to make sure you're protected for beyond retirement, right? And make sure your family's taken care of and your health needs are taken care of. And if, if something happens to your spouse, you have enough money to take care of that. Or we set up the policies in place to make sure you're all set. Does that make more sense? If you say you're just a financial advisor, none of that comes up. Does that make sense? By show of hands, how many, how many people think, okay, good. I'm just trying to get you live. It's hard to be up here at this time of the day for you, but we'll get it. So to create your own so what positioning statement, this is going to be on the CD. So I'm not going to go through the exercise. It'll take 15 to 20 minutes to do this. All you want to look at is what are your three primary concerns your clients face. You heard about all of this earlier today. And then what solutions do you have? What's a good comeback? What are the three things you do to address their primary Concerns. Make sense? All right. So again, that's in the CD. So as I said, do you know how many or how many people are concerned about outliving their assets or health concerns or concerns about the health of, of their parents or the children? Well, what we do, and again, I'd go into the seven life priorities. I guarantee you'll have someone say, whoa, I 
do you do that? Can you tell me more? To which you reply, yes, I'd be happy to. Let's sit down for lunch or a cup of coffee at Starbucks, as you talked about. Let's just sit down for 20 minutes, and I'll go over what we do. That's different from everybody else on the planet. Because when you do that, and when you run a financial practice like that, now you're talking about gaining clients for life. It's asking the right questions and then doing what? Listening, absolutely. Questions and listening. So here's one that one of our clients used. If you want a copy of this book, just let me know. We're not charging for this. And I'll give you my copy when I'm done. So Frank is the guy who hired us for, um, to work on his positioning statement. He had just arrived at his favorite golf course and was introduced to the other two members of his foursome, both business owners. Before they teed off, one of the business owners asked Frank, so what do you do? A typical question. He didn't know, right? And without missing a beat and appearing spontaneous, Frank said, do you know how most business owners have a CFO to help them manage your company's money? Do you know that? Right? Realistic. And the business owner said, yes. And he said, well, what I do is work as a personal CFO for my clients to help them make work optional. And of course, the business owner said, whoa, how do you do that? He said, let's play golf right now. Afterwards, we'll have lunch, and I'll explain more. Now, you've all listened to Paul Harvey over the years. He tells a story, and then what does he say? What does he say? Now, to the rest of the story. All right, let me tell you about Frank. Frank's been with MetLife for 35 years. Million-dollar roundtable. Very successful, great golfer, too handicapped. But if when asked what he did, if Frank said, oh, I'm, I'm with MetLife. What's going through the mind now of this other golfer? Oh, dear God, 18 holes and why I need life insurance. That's not what Frank does, not at all. He covers the whole pie. I mean, if, I, if someone said, oh, I sell life insurance, I'd be thinking, oh, yeah, I just remembered, I've got a root canal, I can't play golf right now. And I'd head out of there, right? But he didn't do that. He captured their attention, and he gained both as clients. So I shared this presentation in Scottsdale last month, and someone raises their hand and says, I can't say I'm a personal CFO. That doesn't work for me. But this is the beauty of scripting. You find what works for you, what resonates inside your heart, inside your chest, inside your brain, and you find something that you create that just rolls off your tongue, like an actor, all right? Or somebody who's well rehearsed. Does that make sense? OK. Um, Jill, I can get the top 10 positioning statements to you. I'll send them to Andrea, OK? And then we'll pass them on. Uh, that way you don't have to create your own stuff. What I've learned over the years is I can create my own stuff or just copy what other people have done who've been successful and just integrate that into my business. I just saved you a whole lot of time. All right, but I'll, I'll get those to Andrea uh, later tonight. Client profile. When I worked with Mark on Working on growing my business. I was number one in sales in the country for the firm I was wholesaling for. I was working seven days a week, and I loved it, except I was burnt out. So I hired Mark Magnatka to teach me how to work smarter. I ended up subsequently writing a book about it, and which is also going to be free to Merrill Lynch in about a month. The revised version is coming out, how to work smarter, not harder. But so when I worked with Mark, he said, how well do you know your clients? And I, you know, Merrill was my biggest client in, when I covered New England. And uh, he said, tell me about your top 20 guys. And I said, oh, they this, that, and knew something. And he said, tell me more. What about the kids? Where are they going to school? What about their parents? Where do they live? What are their favorite hobbies? Where do they like to travel? And what I realized is I had a book of business that was a mile wide, but relationships that were an inch deep. I knew very, very little. And he said, what I want you to do over the next six weeks is sit down with each of your top 25 clients and, and ask them a series of questions. Not 50, right? It's not an interrogation. But ask them a number of questions to really get to know them better and know who they are. And when I did that, what I watched happen over the next 12 months is my business just exploded, not imploded. It exploded in a good way because my clients knew how much more I cared about them. I wasn't just a wholesaler slinging funds. I found out what their challenges were. I found out what value-added presentations they want. Did they, did they know how to do client events? I was an expert at client events. Did they know how to get referrals? I, I've been giving referral presentations for 20 years. So I, when I would ask them, what do you need? And then I would just listen, right? It's consultative selling, asking questions and listening. And I would listen for opportunities. What do they need and how could I help them? And then I became known as Mr. Value-Added. 
and also Mr. Win-Win because that was my license plate. Because my goal was, if I can help my clients succeed more, my clients being Merrill and some of the other firms, does money come back my way? Does the law of reciprocity work? Absolutely, with the right people. You know, good people who understand it is the law of reciprocity. But I get to know them so much better and I created a client profile for each one of my top 20% clients and then grew from there. And then when it came to ask for referrals, they trusted me so much. All I had to ask was a question I'm gonna to give to you all right now as a freebie. Who else do you know who I can help the way I've helped you with your business? And of course they'd say, oh Neil, I give you these three names. And I said, better yet, instead of just giving me three names, would you mind calling them while I'm here? Or can we meet for golf next week? And then it was a personal, warm introduction, as opposed to just another cold call. Does that make sense? So who else do you know who I can help the way I've helped you build your business? Those are consultative questions. Those are just some of them. Um, on my website, I updated the consultative. I've got 10 consultative questions if you want to look at them. Just good questions to ask your clients to get to know them deeper. And if you get to know them deeper, you create lifelong clients. And if you do it right, it's multi-generational, isn't it? 